Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Saturday. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back to House Talk Pregame, ladies and gentlemen. Episode 124. Dr. Pitts, how you doing this morning? Ladies and gentlemen, I, as, as a man, one, one of the first things I learned about being a man and having um, the opposite sex in your life is you have to, at all times, notice all the subtle changes. And somebody did more than a little subtle change. Mm-hmm. Y'all love Dr. Pitt's new hairstyle. Yes or no? I'm well, loving me- it. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Yes. Let me, let me but see, a lot of y'all don't know, behind the scenes for the last 123 episodes, I have slowly and methodically been working on her subconscious to join Team Bald. And all of a sudden, a revelation happened after last Saturday's show, and it spoke to her spirit. It was sizzling in her spirit, y'all. <laughs> she, said, she said, you know what? It's been 20, it's been 28 years since the Cowboys have been relevant in the NFL world. So before the schedule comes out, I'm gonna do something different for my team. I'm gonna I'm gonna lay it all on the line. I love it. I love it. I you know what? I love the dedication. I love the just, you know what? You inspire me to be remain dedicated and disciplined in everything I do. And I appreciate that about you. And I think all of our listeners and viewers especially appreciate it about you as well. It really does look nice, though. Everybody give her a round of applause for her new hairstyle. It looks really nice. I had to ask her, though, before, though, I had to ask her, y'all, you know, just to make sure everything was good. Because, you know, they say when a woman, you know, cuts her hair, it's a brand new chapter. I just wanted to make sure I was in that new chapter, too. So we good, though. I I made sure I was in the new chapter. But I want to tell you about the new chapter, Ronnie, because it is a new chapter, but it's, it's not in the way that people think. So let me just go ahead and clarify. I'm not getting divorced. My husband and I are not separated. We're not having marital problems. We don't hate each other. We're not fighting. There's none of that going on. I haven't suffered any extreme grief and loss. Like there's nothing traumatic going on that prompted me to do this. But you as I mentioned, off just to make sure people don't see nobody behind you, make sure there ain't no sign being held above literally. you. Like, you better say this. <laughs> Look, I don't have a teleprompter, right? <laughs> no teleprompter. So, oh, what, 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 as I was explaining to Ronnie before the show, what happened uh, was that I was in the process of letting my hair grow back before the pandemic hit. Anyway, I was actually wearing my hair like this before the pandemic. And I tend to usually for five to six years at a time, I will wear my hair like this. The first time that I ever had my hair cut this short was back in 2000. And I was going through something at the time. And I walked into a salon in Tallahassee. I was working for FAMU at the time. And I asked who was the best barber in the building. And they pointed me to a gentleman and I said, cut it. And he's like, what what do you mean? And I said, "Do, do whatever it is you do. And I told him straight up, I was like, you know what? They say you're the best barber. I trust you. Make it happen. And it was just so liberating for me at that time. And I wore it like that for about five years. And then I let it grow back. And then I wore it long because my hair grows really, really fast. My natural hair grows very, very long and it's super thick. And I wore it long again for, you know, five, six years. And So every six years or so, I cut it. Well, leading up to the pandemic, I mean, I knew that I was getting married and I said I I wanted to be able to wear an updo for my wedding. So I let it grow back. And then my husband was getting mildly annoyed at me because I won't do anything with it. I just literally would wear it pulled back in a ponytail all the time or pinned up in a bun. And he said, if you're not going to do anything with it, why don't you just cut it again? So he gave me his blessing and I said, pew, 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 and, <laughs> and beeline to the barbershop. But Ronnie, this is my power cut. And I say that because as I've shared, you know, snippets in previous shows, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of dotting eyes and crossing T's um, to open brick and mortar here in the DFW Metroplex. And with that, you know, going to that next dimension and exponentially expanding my private practice, bringing on additional clinicians, bringing on additional life coaches, you know, securing contracts with school districts and organizations and, 
and all that is entailed in expanding my private practice mm -hmm. requires humility, but power at the same time. It right. requires my ability to be able to hold my own in the boardroom and on the block. And this cut just is, is oxygen to my spirit and my soul. I just feel so much more confident and comfortable in my own skin with my hair cut like this and i'm i'm going it's onward and up where god has been blessing beyond measure <clears throat> i'm like you know what it's, i got to cut it off I got to cut it I'm off because i have to make it do what it do i know it's been a few years since you since you've cut it so just as a reminder come november december remember now that breeze hit a little bit different when ain't that much protection up there all right I had I had to learn that the hard way. My first one or two being bald, like that breeze hit a little bit different on that scout, you know. <laughs> Ronnie, my, my barber said that he said when he when he first cut it, he said you feel that breeze on your neck now, don't you? <laughs> he sort of said it. He sort of because they had the air conditioner all high in the barber shop, and I said yeah, but but here's the beauty of it. I do, you know, I, I have my winter hats. I have scullies and stuff like that that I kept. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm feeling really good about it. I'm excited about where, um, I'm going, where my agency is going <clears throat> and I'm just super duper duper excited. Um, yes. our guest for today is Logan and Ronnie. So go ahead and tell them, go ahead and tell them what, what we're up to today, what we're going to be chatting it up about and and why this show is going to be so incredibly, incredibly um, information packed. Right. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a special guest today. Um, he's actually logging in right now, uh, Mr. Phil Dunlap, um, mm -hmm. currently residing in Las Vegas. He has over uh, 30 years of experience in mixed martial arts as a coach, as a fighter himself. Um, he has a, a, a wonderful testimony that he's going to share with us this morning. I had a chance to read his bio and everything and kind of look at... Uh, you say I'm one out. Mm -mm. Bear with us for a moment, folks, while we get these minor technical difficulties worked out. You know, technology. You there you go. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um, and with that being said, so our topic for today is athletic success. <clears throat> and what's your prediction? You know, it's not all, it's not always about the wins and losses. Mm -hmm. Success is a complex equation of overall and personal growth and achievement that occurs in every sport. Success is the peace of mind, which is a direct result of the self-satisfaction and knowing you did your best to become the best that you are capable of becoming. So we're going to be talking about what are some things that can help you become successful in your athletic career and how that can also translate, not just in your athletic career, but in life as well. Um, and so, Phil, do we have you on, man? Is he there? He's not there yet. Okay. Well, so I do, I, well, <laughs> while, we, while we're getting him connected, I do want to go over his bio real quick because... Um, he did provide us with a bio, and I thought it was an absolute phenomenal way to uh, kind of, you know, set the scene for who who we have today. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, the Asylum Fight Team White Rhino MMA and Brazil Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is run by Phil Dunlap, a former fighter with over 25 years of running a school fight team with the Asylum Fight Gym in the New York metro area, while also trying training countless fighters who have competed in mixed martial arts, submission grappling, and Thai boxing prior to having closed the school down to some uh, health complications. Back in 24, back in 2014, Phil moved to Vegas after his health had um came back and he missed training. So he decided to open up a uh, Vegas gym of the As Asylum Fight Team. Um, <clears throat> he's also recognized as a lineage holder in the CAC, I hope I'm saying this right, the Kakin Arts from Northern Burma. He was trained in the Kakin fighting systems by his grandfather, William Wild Bill O'Shaughnessy. I hope I said his last name too, uh, the correct way, who received the lineage from his instructor, Dua Teen Na, <clears throat> in what is now the area known as uh, Jagoon in the Kakin state while living and fighting side by side with the Jingba people prior to and during World War II. Wow. His actions and deeds through these years led him to become proclaimed uh, Jingpa. After passing, Phil became the designated lineage holder. Wow. Um, 
<clears throat> Phil was a very active professional fighter between the ages of 16 and almost 26, fighting constantly until breaking his neck in a terrible car accident just before his 26th birthday. <laughs> After being told he would never do anything physical again, he rehabbed his body and started the asylum to pass on the Kekin systems of fighting. While training other fighters to fight, he decided to prove the doctors wrong and fight one more time. Well, fight again. At the age of 36, he received medical clearance and took, took his first fight back at uh, GS03 held in Atlanta. It was a main event super fight against Pride 2 and reality super fighting. Um, <clears throat> also, too, after battling cancer, and getting his health back in February 2015 at the age of 52, he started competing in no gi submission grappling in uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu tournaments again. Usually the oldest competitor there, he competed in a number of weight classes. According to Phil, he feels he's been lucky enough to have three separate careers coming back twice after doctors had written him off. Phil has had over 250 matches since turning 53, competing in professional shows and winning numerous tournaments. Wow. Wow. Man, you know um, what my my synopsis of everything that you said is? He can kick anybody's donkey all over the room that he wants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I, always, I always tell people, run up on an old person if you want to. Not to say he old, and I'm not calling you old, Phil, but I mean, you know, you're just a little bit older than me, just a little bit. But, you know, run up <laughs> on an old person if you want to, and it's going to be a long day for you. You know, yeah, that yeah. Point, He messed up your whole day. Yeah, it's all pride at that point. I think we got <laughs> Phil on. Phil, how you doing, sir? Can you guys finally hear me? I can. can, hear you can. I, I was having a problem with my computer, so I had to I, I had to log on by phone. Sorry about that. It all right, it's all right. right. Man, take your time, man. Take your time. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing wonderfully, and thanks for having me on. And also, oh. thanks for the big buildup. I hope I'm not that much of a disappointment. I'm just an old guy trying to survive <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I, hey man, and, and, and we're and I'm a young, I'm a uh, young, a little bit younger guy trying to do the same exact thing as you, man. So I feel you on that, man. I feel yeah. it's a yeah. journey. And it's a couple never- little things. It's it's actually catching, but other than that, you did great. And I had also I lost I also left left Vegas for uh, Lexington, Virginia, about a year and a half ago. All right, welcome to Virginia, sir. I'm in Central Virginia. Thank you, so Virginia, man. <laughs> how do you, I, I how love do you it here. Think? How do you like Northern? Well, okay, so you like that traffic up there, man? Oh, no, I'm in Lexington. I'm right down in Central Virginia by uh, William and, uh, what is it? By VMI. College of William and Mary? Yes. Oh, oh, by v- you said by V. Oh, okay, word. Okay, that's what's up. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's beautiful down there. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm like, when I say in the middle of nowhere, we have 85 acres in the middle of nowhere, and we're building a family compound out here. Wow, nice. that's dope. That's dope, man. Well, Phil, thank you for coming on, man. Um, so I know I kind of gave the people a little bit about who you are, man. But since we got you on the show, man, if you don't mind just telling the people a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you're at today, man. Well, I'm actually a person who uh, grew up in the Burmese martial arts, which is, which is kind of unique because they always had a, a no hold barred flavor. Uh, mm-hmm. Burmese kickboxing or left way is uh, no rules kickboxing. Any strike is legal. And you can take somebody down. There's no gloves. Three knockouts wins the fight. And headbutts are illegal. That's why the nickname, the white rhino. I had 28 knockouts by headbutt. So, you know, you just picture somebody. Now, this is not the brightest thing in the world. Okay. You, you decide, okay, headbutts really work for me. So I'm going to use them. It's not like I have a brain in my head that I could damage. So it's, kind of, it, it, it's one of those things that like, you know, it's an interesting form of kickboxing and I grew up in it. And like, I, I try to tell people like, you know, I didn't have a class, like you, you see martial arts schools and stuff like that. I didn't have a class for me. It was, it was playing with my grandfather and it was one of those things. There were certain things I had to do in order to train. So it, it almost like my, my grandfather was like a, a hard man. In other was he came up hard and he was just a hard tough individual so for me it was kind of like I think I excelled at uh, martial arts and fighting because it was one of those things where I got his attention and his love so like when somebody asked me like you know one of the, one of the keys to my success is the fact that I wanted his attention and love so I trained obsessively and you know it was kind of like I, I also I also to this day I'm 60 years old I just love to train like, I, you know, if I, I just had a, a tumor removed from, from my neck a month ago, and within two weeks, I was already back on the mat stream. Man, man, wow. So it, it, it's safe to say that, you know, fighting mixed martial arts and, and just, you know, the, the world of martial arts has been kind of like your therapy, your best friend, or, you know, kind of like your... Mm-hmm. 
your end all, well, not end all, be all, but just like the thing that really keeps you going day in and day out. Like that one thing like, you can like, always to yourself I tried, I, I try to tell people it's become part of who I am. You know, it's become part of the fabric of my life. So it's kind of like, it's it's almost like my sense of center. Like, you know, people go for a therapy. Okay. And I'm one of those guys, like, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of hobbies. I could, like people look at me and say, oh, oh, you get punched in the face on Wednesday morning for fun. And it's kind of like, I say, well, yeah, yeah. It might be a little bit crazy to you, but what about that guy that's climbing a rock overhang? Like, you mm -hmm. know, hey, I'd be wetting myself. Okay. In other words, you know, there's things that scare the hell out of me too. So right. it's kind of like, I, I'm one of those ones. I never judge anybody else's passions because our passions a lot of times are what would help us get through the, the, okay. I, 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 I have been around the world a lot and, you know, in, encountered a lot of belief systems. And I always mm -hmm. loved the belief, the Buddhist concept of, okay, life is suffering. Okay, they'll always be suffering. You can't avoid the suffering. It's there. Okay, so enjoy the good times while they're here because suffering's right around the corner. It's the natural state of life. And I, I, I honestly, honestly believe, you know, we're, you know, one of the things to success in life, and I always tell people, you, you can get it through training. And I don't care whether it's football, wrestling, mixed martial arts, anything where you have to spend a lot of time trying to excel at something. You learn the, 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 you get the tools to, to lead a better life, whether you're paying attention to it or not. Okay. Work ethic. In other words, you have to embrace the suck because there's times life just sucks. Okay. You've got to work hard. Like if you want to do well in relationships, you, you've got to work on it. If you want to do well in at work, school, whatever, you have to work at it. Okay. Life is about, you know, deciding what you want and i and i'm a big one i tell my athletes this all the time uh a lot of times it's a trade-off between momentary pleasure and what you really want mm, yes and oh, it, it, and i think action. exactly mm -hmm. absolutely and so <clears throat> man thank you for sharing that man that, that was a, a beautiful way to open up um so i i, I see that you started fighting at 16 so you were, you know, it started off as you just, you know, getting to spend quality time with your grandfather and everything. And he opened your eyes to this world of, of fighting. But for you, it was just a way of life at that time. So how did adopting that, um, that style and having that, you know, those type of skills early on and being able to, you know, basically defend yourself at, you know, especially at your age, you know, elementary age, middle school age, and then getting to, you know, fighting at 16 and everything. How did those skills kind of help you developing through school and everything? Um, and what I mean by that is, did you did you yourself experience any type of bullying or any situations in the school where you actually had to use some of the skills your grandfather had taught you? Um, and what was some of what was your early life like in that in that regard? Well, honestly, it was one of those things. I I, I listen. I, you know, I'm not the person. I wasn't the person at 20 that I am today. Okay. And I always say that's one of the great things about being human. In other words, we can say to ourselves, I don't like who I am now. And then, you know, set in, in, in steps, a process to change, to change, to be a better person, to, to be more successful, whatever. And it, it's kind of funny growing up. Okay. My grandfather, when I was, you know, like 10 years old was being, bringing in adults to train with me. Okay, so I, like, when it came to fighting, there was there was nothing that scared me. Okay, it was one of those ones like I was never bullied. And I was almost like, and I don't want to say that I was the anti bully, because I will be honest with you. At that time, I never met a fight I didn't like. Okay, if there was a fight. <laughs> I wanted to play too. Okay. So, so what would happen is I've actually been told by people that I went to high school with that I met well, grade school that I met years later that mm -hmm. I was the bully's bully. Okay. So in other words, if you were giving a bully, if a bully was giving you a hard time, they had to come see you fight me. If there was a fight out at three o'clock uh, behind school at three o'clock, I'd go. And if one mm -hmm. of the kids didn't want to fight, I'm like, Hey, I'll do it. You know, by the time I was like at six, Love grade, it. Love nobody it. would, nobody would go near me. Okay. It was like, you know, people just like, you know, when there was like, when there was, when there was trouble, nobody, nobody wanted part of me. But the downside of that was I, I came from a family and I, I grew up in the Bronx 
and my dad had, had been involved in uh, organized crime with Westies. Okay, so he had actually done time for manslaughter and arson. And I, I, I came from like rough people. So I grew up realizing, you know, as a teen, I went into professional fighting, but I also realized that it was a violence is a commodity. Mm. Most people, most people fear violence. Okay, right. so a lot of times violence will get you what you wanted. So, you know, remember where I was fighting, I was fighting in Burma, the Golden Triangle. Okay, mm -hmm. I got very involved in some bad things. I collected money, you know, I sold drugs, I did everything I wasn't supposed to do into my early 20s. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it was kind of like, you know, I realized that that's not the person I wanted to be. So I, I, I put all of that behind me. And, you know, I focused on fighting, then I broke my neck, which kind of, kind of sent me into this weird spin where I actually found you know, as an end result, I found myself. Mm. I found the person I wanted to be, not necessarily the person that my upbringing made me. Mm. Got you. And I, and I like how you said that, man, you know, and one of the things you just talked about, <clears throat> and I think it was really important for people to understand is, you know, I always tell people this all the time, you know, from birth to 17, you know, we just record information and just, you know, perceive everything that we're seeing from our our parents, our loved ones, and the people around us. And we're just recording all this information. When we get on our own, when we get 18, get out on our own and everything, it's natural for us to subconsciously relate back to and resort back to the things we saw the adults around us doing in certain situations. And for you to describe how, you know, yeah, being in certain areas and, you know, that influence of maybe being around the wrong set of people and making the wrong choices at their early age was simply just you acting subconsciously on things that you had been seeing your entire life and to you know you know unfortunately you know the having breaking your neck kind of being that moment of like man I need to pivot to something different I need to really you know find out what my identity is what was what was that like what was that recovery like of having that downtime and I would imagine that was probably the first time that you actually actually had to sit down and not really move what was that like well I I, I still remember waking up on a backboard Okay. And for about a week, I couldn't move. I couldn't move anything. I was petrified. Then the, some of the swelling went down and I was able to move again. And I refused the surgery because if, they, if they'd done the surgery, basically I never would have been able to do anything again. Okay. Because they were going to fuse my skull to my top vertebrae because I'd broken the atlas. Okay. And, and like what they told me is they told me the only reason I was alive is because of like the density of the muscle tissue in my neck. Mm, you know, just from all my years of training and, and you get the type of kickboxing I did, somebody's always pulling on your neck, grappling, mm. somebody's always pulling and tw twisting on your neck. Like when a doctor removed the, uh, the tumor from my neck, you know, he looked at me afterwards when I went back a week later and he goes, what the hell do you do with your neck? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, even a little tiny muscles mm. are bigger and thicker. He had, he, he spent... An, an, er, an operation he said would normally take about three and a half hours took him six and a half okay just because of the amount of cutting he had to do into muscle mm -hmm. tissue so mm -hmm. it, it, it's one of those things that you know it's you know it can save you fighting can save your life in a lot of ways but the broken neck you know i was one of those people that i came up on the path of live fast die young leave a pretty corpse Okay, everybody told me, oh, you won't make it to 21, you won't make it to 25, whatever. So suddenly at 26, I've got this broken neck. I'm in the phone, hon. I, I've, uh, I've got this broken neck, and it's one of those things that um, I, I have, like, you know, I have a choice to make. You know, yeah, I'm in a lot of pain. I'm thinking to myself, do I drive off a bridge and just end it? Or do I buckle down and try to come back from it? So I made the decision I was going to do everything in my power to come back from it. And the idea is I, I started to rehab myself. Uh, it also helped me, me segue career-wise. I used a lot of connections I had to get into government contracting. And I, I became a government contract professional. And it's it, it's been it's been very good for me. I've never I've never done martial arts for money, 
I've always I've always done it, you know, as as a fun thing because I have I have a bit I have a business and I have a life and I make good money someplace else. And martial arts, especially fighting arts, is not a good business model. You don't make a lot of living, a, lot, a good living because people don't want to get punched in the face. You know, it's kind of that's that's counterintuitive to human nature. Mm-hmm. But uh, the, the broken neck really made me, you know, focus on who I wanted to be coming out of it. Mm-hmm. which I think was a good one. I wanted, I wanted to be a better person. I wanted to help people. I wanted, I wanted to do positive things in the world because I had died in that car accident. What would my, you know, and I'll be honest with you, like people all the time and say, oh, I wish I was you. You, could, you can kick ass, this, that, the other thing. It's not what I want to be known at. I want to be known at, known as a guy who helped other people, a guy who was a good guy. Okay, you know, let, let's face it, beating people up, it's like, you know, it, it, yeah, it, you know, if somebody jumps you, it's cool. But that's not exactly something you want, you know, to be your your legacy in life, you know. Mm-hmm. And 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 it really made me made me decide who I wanted to be, and I, and I slowly started to work my way there. And it's you know, by the time I was thirty, you know, I was training again. You know, I'd, I'd started lifting. I'd started training again. Uh, my grandfather had died when I was uh, twenty nine, so I ended up I ended up teaching other people, opening a school. And, you know, I started to teach other people. I loved it. I was a horrible teacher. You know, I was a fighter who, here, let me show you this move. And, and, and it's kind of funny. I'll never forget walking upstairs and telling my wife at the time, either I am the worst teacher in the world, or these guys are retarded. And she goes, what do you mean? Well, I showed them a move. I, I thought I was going to show everybody moves. They were going to have it. And everybody a year later was going to be out running their own schools. And she's like, how many hours have you spent doing this crap in your life? And I'm like, I guess so. And, and what happened is over the last like 30 years, I've grown into actually being a teacher as opposed to a guy who just beats people up. Right. right. But one, one of the things I've noticed, and, 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 and as time goes by, you know, your perspective on different things change, such as, uh, let's say the broken neck. You know, up until I I was in my 40s, I always viewed it as I was cheated out of my prime. Mm. Okay, now I have CTE. In my late 40s, CTE started to set in. I started to get foggy at night. You know, it's not that bad. And, you know, I, it's manageable and hasn't really affected my cognitive abilities at work. So, so it's not a real issue yet. But, like, mm. I view it as I'd be a drooling fool now, if not for the broken neck. Like I would have taken more hits to the head. So in a way, it was a savior. Right. And perspective so, you know, some... perspective is huge in a lot of situations. I always tell people, you know, you can have multiple people see the same thing and each person will have a different perspective about what they just saw. And some people with that perspective, what they've witnessed, like you said, they'll see it as, okay, I can have some optimism and some type of, you know, maybe fortune later down the road. And some people look at it as like, man, this is just, you know, this is just who I am. This is just, this is just woe is me all over again. And that's, that's really important to really have perspective, especially in situations like that, that are those pivotal moments or those fork in a row moments in our life where, you know, whatever decision you make will alter the trajectory of your life. And so having, having a optimistic perspective about those situations is crucial to really get through those. And, and I like how you really describe that, man. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, my pleasure. Go ahead, Dr. Pitts. Phil, I, I, Wow. <laughs> Just wow, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm really curious about something. When I think about the times that I, particularly when I was working with kids in my clinical practice, and I was referring kids to martial arts for discipline purposes, because they were dealing with oppositional defiant disorder or intermittent explosive disorder, or those those behavioral conditions that they were really struggling with learning how to respond properly to authority. And I would advise parents to consider putting their children in martial arts so that they could learn how to regulate their emotions. I've always seen martial arts as an an art that requires a tremendous amount of discipline. But then when I hear you share your life's journey, it almost seems conflicting. Can, can, you speak to, can you speak to the discipline aspect of mixed martial arts, whether you're actually you know, fighting or not, I, as it relates to 
your choices in life to, to sort of engage in some of the risky behaviors. Can you sort of tease that out for our listeners? That's, that, that is actually an excellent question. Okay, to this day, I am the anti-martial art martial artist. It's kind of like, how do I phrase this? I'm a lifelong vegan. A lot of vegans don't like my philosophy on veganism. Okay, and it's kind of like, because I have, I have a very strong opinion. Martial arts, okay, has taken on connotations on revisionist history in a, in a cultural setting. And what I mean by that, I've done a couple of speeches at college about culture and how it affects martial arts. When you look at the, when, when you look at the Japanese samurais, they were bullies. They had a code of conduct, but it only applied to them. Okay, when you look throughout Japanese history, there's all sorts of historical issues where one samurai would switch sides in the middle of battle and betray betray his, his lord and master. Okay, so a lot of what we get on, on martial arts is revisionist history. The Japanese couldn't wait to get rid of the samurai when they had the chance. Then suddenly at World War II to rationalize their nationalism, they made the samurai a hero again. And it, it's kind of like, if you, if you really look at the cultural influence of martial arts, to me, martial arts was not, is nothing more than a systemized way of passing down fighting. Okay, to me, that's what true martial arts is. Now, the side note is like, I always told people, you come to me and, and I'll be honest with you, you get the qu the first time you come into my school, I like, I don't teach kids because I'm like, I'm a your typical New Yorker, I'm abrasive. And my guess is as good as yours as to what's going to come out my mouth next. Okay, like I say stuff that like people, did he actually say that? And it's, it's one of those things where I tell people, you come to me because I fight better than you. I'm not a better person than you. I'm not a better this than you. I'm not a better that than you. But what happens is you, through the process of learning this stuff, just like going to football, you go to football practice, you work hard. You learn to work hard. You learn to become part of a team. You learn this, you learn that, but you didn't go there for that. You went there to play football. So I tell people, if you're coming to me, you're coming to me either learn how to fight or get in shape while learning how to fight or because you just like it okay and if you happen to get self-discipline from it yes great if you happen to become a better person from it great you know all the all the side benefits that may come from martial arts to me are side benefits okay mm -hmm. but i know many high level martial artists that are horrendous human beings Okay, how many times do we see uh, a martial art instructor get in trouble for being a pedophile? How many times do we see a, a martial arts instructor taking advantage of his position? And he's 35 years old and he's sleeping with 18 year old students. Okay, these things go on all the time. It's just, just like in our school systems and every place else. Okay, you know, martial artists, through the process of training, you, you can learn to fight, okay? And there's all sorts of other side benefits, but you have to take the step to open yourself up to the other lessons. And one of the, you know, I, I am a very much combat sport, reality-based self-defense person. And my thing is like in the case of, uh, of a child who has uh, like sudden outbursts, we jokingly refer to it as when you first start sparring, the new guy gets hit and then he goes full retard. Okay. In other words, he makes a funny face and he starts throwing, like he's flails like a window. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then his partner, who's a little bit better than him, just starts picking at him. Jab, jab. And then you're telling him, calm down. You know, that's not going to help you in a fight. Calm down. Suddenly they learn to manage those outbursts, not because consciously they wanted to manage the outbursts, but if they don't manage the outbursts, they can get picked apart. So it, it actually, it, to me, a lot of what gets attributed to martial arts is, is more or less don't pay attention to the bowing. And to me, all of that is, 
is cultural appropriation and nonsense. Mm-hmm. Okay, the lessons learned in actual hard training or what will make you more disciplined, will make you a better person, will make you stronger. Not, not mimicking, I, I, I'm sorry, but to me, parroting things teaches people to, to play a role. It's like, if you ever go into, I, I had a drug problem when I was younger. and I uh, got in trouble and I was in a TC for a little while, a therapeutic community. And the first thing that you learn in those places is how to parrot the party line to get out. Mm-hmm. Okay. And like I told people, some people really buy into the program. Now, now those programs actually gave me the power later on to give up drugs and alcohol. Okay. They gave me the tools, but at the time I was not ready for the tools. Okay. And that's what happens a lot in martial arts. A lot of times the person just wants to learn to fight. Mm-hmm. And, and basically that was me. I just wanted to be the best fighter in the world. And I, I joke around. I've been fortunate to have three careers. Okay. I had, I had the career before uh, the broken neck and it's kind of like that idea is in your typical late teens, early twenties, I wanted to be the baddest man, in the lo- baddest man alive. I was going to beat people senseless. How dare they take the fight with me? I have to make them pay. Okay. Then in my 30s and early late 30s, early 40s, I came back and I came back for all the wrong reasons. I came back because I felt I had to. I came back because I wanted to prove doctors wrong. You know, there were a whole list of things I came back for. And then it was kind of like I really didn't enjoy it that much. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because I didn't want to beat people up anymore. Okay. It was almost like something was missing. And then when I when I when I came back. The third time after after the pancreas issues, I came back the third time and it was kind of like, oh my God, this is the, you know, and I'm 53. This is the best thing ever. I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe somebody paid me money and flew me to Portland to get in the cave. This is unbelievable. You know, and now I'm having the time of my life. I go out and compete and it's kind of like, I don't care whether I win. Okay, let me rephrase that. I do not like to lose at checkers. I do not like to lose at anything. I have learned as an athlete to accept losing and lose with graciousness and dignity. Okay, I hug my opponent. I compliment my opponent. Give him all the credit in the world. He won. He was the better man that day. That's cool. Okay, I don't like to lose, but I'm perfectly cool with it. Just the fact that I'm out there Mm -hmm. to me is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. Right. And I and that's a great point. And, and if I could even piggyback on the ideal of wins and losses, is one of the is one of my uh, foundational pillars that I really preach to a lot of young men is, you know, I don't believe in wins and losses. I believe in wins and lessons. And I always tell young men, the only time it's a loss is when you refuse to look at the lesson in the loss. You know, even in wins, you know, yeah, when you win in everything, even if you won by one point, if you won by a TKO or, you know, split decision, whatever the case may be, you won. The chances of you really going back and look at what you could have done better might not be uh, as much motivation for you, whether when you lose. And I always tell people when you do lose, that moment right there is for you to look at one of two things. What could I have done better and what can I take from this and use it going forward? And that perspective on winning, losing, especially when you said having that humbleness, having that gratitude of just being in that arena, being in that space to share that space, share that octagon, share that that mat with somebody else and to have that moment, that experience, that's a win regardless. You know, and obviously if you get the win in the match, hey, that's even better. But if not, there's a lesson to take from that that can be applied, not in that moment and going back to change what happened, but going forward. And I like how you said that. Um I- do want to get your thoughts on something real quick. Um, and I think this would be really important um, uh, to kind of flesh out. So you talked about how a lot of times um, fighters, mixed martial artists, boxers, whatever the case may be, people who like to fight, sometimes they can, you know, easily become a bully because I think a lot of times people, you know, they will uh, neglectfully take being able to fight as, you know, they're better than people. They, you know, have kind of a false sense of confidence in how they approach situations and other people. But then a lot of times, too, and we see in the younger generations, the generations that are coming up now, it almost seems as like self-defense fighting, you know, having, you know, just shooting the fair one at that point is almost kind of like being banned from our society. And unfortunately, we see where when kids can't, you know, have a fair, you know, dispute about a situation at their age that they find they need to feel the need to dispute about, 
we see kids resorting to other methods of handling situations, whether that's gun violence, whether that's going to drugs, whether that's suicide and things like that. How important do you think it is for kids not to necessarily learn how to, you know, become great fighters or good fighters, but how important do you think it is for our kids, especially our young, our young males, to have that idea of being able to defend themselves and have that confidence within themselves that they can handle unfortunate situations if they were to come out, but not using it to be neglectful or, like you said, as a bully? Well, you know, it's one of those things that, and, and that's great because it, it, it's something that, you know, troubles me a lot. You know, because I, I, when I, when I was growing up, I grew up in an area where between you and I, you walk down the wrong block. Like I went, in, I, I lived in the Irish neighborhood. I went into mm -hmm. the Italian neighborhood, the Hispanic neighborhood. There was going to be trouble. You know, mm -hmm. that, you know, that's the way it was. Okay, right. yeah, and, but but also like you know, okay. Do you did you walk up to the biggest toughest kid in your school and start making fun of him? Nah. Uh, well, Why? Oddly enough, I, <laughs> I've been yeah. big on my life, so I was I was the biggest kid in my class. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, but, but what I'm saying is, but when what, I got to high school, you know, when I I was a freshman on the varsity team. And uh, when I made varsity, you know, all the junior and senior linemen, now mind you, they're six, four, six, five, you I know, know. <laughs> they're, they're 17, 18 years old. These are grown men to me at 14. And they're looking at me like, bro, what the hell are you doing here? Like, why are you with us? And then when I went out there to show them like, you know, hey, look, I'm 14, but <laughs> I'm coming, you know, I, yeah. I gained the respect in that sense, but I, I didn't fear that challenge. To me, I always looked at it as a challenge, like in football, I'm six one. So in football terms, I'm short. I'm, you know, not tall for football. So when I would go against linemen who are six three, six five, hell, the biggest person I ever went against in football was six eight, four fifty, just an absolute just Goliath of a human being. And I those challenges I would just like be ready to run through the wall for because it's like for me, that was a personal challenge just for me to see. Well, how good am I? Like, you know, for me, that gave me confidence in knowing that whether you were bigger than me, stronger than me, whatever, I'm going to give you that work. Like, this ain't no easy W for you. Like, you come over here, you're going to work. You're going to earn this W. And if you get you're the W. You're going to pay a price. Hey, you you got it today. Don't let me catch you again because I'm going to get, I, I want my run. I want to run it back. But you got it today. And so, but for me, it gave me confidence in knowing that I could defend myself or if I find myself in a situation where somebody might be bigger, stronger, whatever the case may be. I knew enough about me and I knew enough of my skills that I could do what I had to do to get out of harm's way. Not a lot of kids or not a lot of young people nowadays feel that way without having a gun on their hip or, well, you know, they got to have multiple people around them to get into a fight. It's completely different how society, you know, I don't like to judge, you know, but it's really made, you know, in some instances, a lot of our younger people kind of like soft and, you know, maybe a little bit more sensitive to situations where it's like, okay, you have a disagreement with somebody. If you get in a fight, Fight it, shake hands, keep it pushing. It's not that big of a deal. I think sometimes we make small situations, do or die situations that have no reason being that type of situation. That's 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 one of the things that I, I was thinking about too, is it used to be that you and I would go behind the school, mm -hmm. throw a few hands, you know, let's say you went down, you'd had enough, I'd help you up. And then and then we were boys. Like you right. and I were inseparable, okay? Because I respected you because you stood in front of me. I stood in front of you. But we also learned that there's repercussions for our words, for our actions. Uh, we call a kid a name and he smacks us in the face, okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe I shouldn't be, you know, nobody wants to get smacked in the face. So nah, maybe right. I shouldn't call that kid names anymore. Okay, and I think the, the other thing that's, that's, that's weird is Okay, and I, I'm not talking, I'm not talking, you know, I don't consider hitting women masculine. You know, I keep hearing about all this toxic masculinity stuff. And it's almost like we're taking every uh, male trait and making it negative. Yes, hitting women is bad. Getting drunk and, and picking fights is bad. These things are bad. Doesn't, mm -hmm. but in other words, like you hit, a, you hit a woman, as far as I'm concerned, you lose your man card. Okay, right. you're no longer a man, you're a bitch. I'm sorry. That's the way that's the way I'm I'm built. But it's kind of like, but I also believe male traits, like you know, like how do I phrase this? Nobody, nobody likes the warrior mm -hmm. until somebody comes after them. Like, you know, they, mm -hmm. they kind of want to keep you in a break glass in case of emergency position. Okay, right. yeah, when right. bad shit happens, uh, go get him. 
okay? But when bad shit's not happening, we don't want him around, okay? Because he, mm -hmm. you, you never know because he's violent, okay? He may not actually be violent. He, he's the guy that steps up and says, no, not that line. You don't cross that line. But the, the other thing I've noticed is, is that confidence of knowing and like, I don't know whether it's a look in my face. A lot of people say it's the way I carry myself. But as I've gotten older, you know, guys start screaming at you in a parking. Like, the last thing I want to do, first of all, I got a room full of people that I taught to fight. So, And I know they can fight. So if I want to fight, I'm going to go to that room and fight. If I want a really hard fight, I'm going to take a competition and get a really hard fight. I don't want to beat some guy who can't fight up, fight in the street. Okay, makes no sense. Nothing good comes of that. You know, best case scenario, I hit him, he gets hurt, I, I get sued. Bad, bad right. things happen. Okay, my, my reaction nowadays is somebody gets all in my face and everything like that. I ask them once, please quiet them. The second time I look at them and I say, either shut the fuck up or start throwing punches. Please throw punches. I'm more comfortable with that. You'd be surprised how often that stops the whole situation. Okay, because when it comes to the strong punches things, I do that. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Okay, mm -hmm. this whole screaming at each other thing. I'm sorry, I can't get angry enough to scream about anything. I feel it. And I think, I think that's a really great point. A lot of times, and I think society has kind of made it to where, like, it's funny, I, I have a client, he's uh, 12, and kid you not mom texted me before the session saying hey just want to give you a heads up uh such and such was suspended for three days for fighting and i'm like okay you know cool we'll talk about it so he gets in the session and we start to talk and i'm like you know yeah your mom told me you know you got suspended today you know just tell me what happened literally all that happened was is he went to lunch got his lunch sat down kid that he's kind of cool with but you know they you know they just see each other in class and every now and then decided that day he was gonna take his lunch and throw it in the trash can they got into a shoving match, a shoving match, got suspended for three days. And I was like, you got suspended for shoving? My and nephew I asked him, I was like, now, had you, had you known you was going to get suspended for three days, would you have thrown a punch? He was like, yeah, I probably would have if I knew I was going to get suspended. I was like, yeah, next time, just throw the punch. Like, so I, I feel what you're saying, you know, all that rah-rah, you know, like, don't talk about it, be about it. And one of the things my dad always told me, he was like, it only takes one punch to get knocked out. That's it. Just one. If you get caught slipping because you over there running your mouth yelling and stuff and they decide to cock back and throw a punch, that's on you. So you better be ready instead of doing all that yelling and hollering. I feel you on that. So <clears throat> I, I, I got to okay. jump in. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. I got no, you're fine. I got to jump in because I it, and feel I am totally saying this in jest. So so usually after a show, I have something I have to do when I post a show. I'm going to have to edit this because I'm always and I'm clowning you, sir. I swear I'm clowning you because Ronnie has a mouth on him. And I'm always telling him, Ronnie, you go get us thrown off the air. You go get us thrown off the air. So my husband is texting me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to have to do some edits. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm about to do some edits because he didn't drop the F bomb, he didn't drop the R bomb, he didn't drop the S bomb, but we love you for it, man. My, my husband is loving you, loving you, loving you because your transparency is just absolutely commendable and, and it's extraordinary. And I love, love, love that. But I, I, I want to. I want to ask you a couple of questions around mental health, because that's what House Talk Pregame is all about, right? It's about this, this marriage between sports and mental health. And as you have shared such a phenomenal life's journey, the buzzwords are screaming at me, right? Because when we think about this, this term, adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, man, you're hitting all the ACEs buttons. I was like, yep, yeah, his, his ACE scores a 10, you know? But here you are at 60 years old, doing the darn thing, owning businesses, you know, competing globally, traveling the world, training other people to be extraordinary fighters. As you think about, you know, having a father that was incarcerated for Mansour and Austin, uh, growing up in a family that was mob connected, drugs and the other bad things, and then the injuries that you sustained and now dealing with CTE, can you connect the dots for our listeners as to your awareness about how any or all of these things impacted your mental health in any way? And 
what did you do or do you do to stay sane amidst mm -hmm. some of the really challenging adversities that you encountered throughout your life's journey? You just hit the magic button. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, now, I wear this on my sleeve because I, I believe telling people about it will, oh, oh wait, wait, he gets help? Mm. If he can get help, maybe I should too. Okay, now, first of all, my mother was schizophrenic. My grandmother was schizophrenic. Okay, I I had been touched, okay, in, in seventh grade, there was a really bad incident. There was a kid who was three years older than me, and my younger brother was two years younger than me. He beat my younger brother up. So I went, I made a beeline for the park, ran to the park, punched him in the head, knocked him out. He'd gotten off the swings and screamed, what? I punched him. Then I dragged him over the curb and I started jumping up and down his head. Okay. I ended up in Bergen Pines, which in, in their psychiatric ward for the summer on Thursday. Okay, I have been diagnosed as from as everything from uh, at first they thought I had schizophrenia. Then there was yeah, I made a mistake of telling uh, I, I told the psychiatrist at the court appointed that uh, it wasn't my fault. He made me mad because at the time as a kid, like you know, you did something to me, you made me mad. Whatever happened. That was now on you. You made me mad. I wasn't mad before you started. Okay, that's the way my ma mind worked. And I guess that was a buzzword for them. Okay, sociopath comes up, this comes up, that comes up. Okay, and then move on. There was, you know, there were various diagnoses. Okay, I was for, for a long time, I, I should say at, at around 30. And I'll be honest with you, with drugs and alcohol, I'd given up drugs at 22. And I was battling alcohol from about 24 to about 30, in which case I, I went to a psychopharmacologist and, uh, or a psychiatrist sent me to a psychopharmacologist and I ended up on uh, Prozac. Mm -hmm. My world changed. I woke up one day, I called her up and I said, there's something wrong. And she goes, what do you mean? The world is different. And she goes, I don't understand. And I said, well, put it this way. Color TV as compared to black and white. Mm -hmm. I would sit there and look at leaves. And for the first time in my life, I would see the green. And I would see the, uh, the veins in the leaves. And I was like, fascinated by the weirdest stuff. And they also put me on lithium for a while. But, uh, and that helped. But I had to go off the lithium because I didn't like the way it made me feel. So with the Prozac, I've been able to much better manage my own issues. And I've had the, I've had the whole thing where uh, I, I, I hear voices in my head. Okay, but they're, they're now when I was younger, I thought they were outer voices. Now I know it's just thoughts. But it's kind of like it's one of those things where I, I tell people all the time, there's no shame. Like if you if you're a diabetic and you need insulin, you'd be a moron not to take insulin. Okay, my life is markedly better with mental health uh, medication. And also, I'll be honest with you, talk therapy really helped me for a while and martial arts helped me for a while. Talk therapy, I, 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 I don't go anymore, but it really helped me put a lot of things in perspective. Like, you know, you know how there's that whole, whoa, more is me. I had a bad mom. I had a bad dad. I did. I had that. Okay. And not that I'm, I'm diminishing anybody's experience, but at some point I need to wake up and realize they were flawed human beings. I'm not perfect. They, they were truly flawed human beings. Okay. So. In other words, I, I have the rest of my life to live. I can either sit here and, and, and suffer because my parents sucked, or I can make a good life for myself because I want a good life for myself and I can break the cycle so that my kids have good lives, I have good relationships, and that's what it's all about. Man, man. thank you for answering that, man. That, 
I like how you also said too, and this is one of the things I always try to, you know, remind people when about, you know, introducing medication interventions into their mental health journey is a lot of times people think that when you get on medication, the medication is supposed to cure whatever mental health concern you have. And I remind them said, no, the, the, the medicine is not meant to cure your mental health. What it is meant to do is to provide you a space, a safe space within your own right, within your own head to process some of those things and work through some of those things that have been challenging you when you didn't have this medical intervention. And I like how you beautifully said that and how it's been sustainable for you all this time alongside with talk therapy, alongside with physical activities such as mixed martial arts and other things like that, how a combination of those things can really set you apart and really help you along your mental health journey and help you see the changes that you want to be within yourself. Thank you for sharing that, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in like whether it's alcoholism, drug addiction, mental health, the major key is you need to want, I'm talking really want, like my, my primary, my primary, it's kind of funny, my primary goal in giving up alcohol was watching my father die of cirrhosis of the liver. Hmm. Okay, and I did not want to go, he, he didn't die of cirrhosis of the liver, he got half, half his liver removed, started drinking again, and then got pancreatic cancer and died. But it's one of those things that I did not want to go out like him. I thought it was pathetic. And, and that wasn't going to be me. So sometimes we just need something to, to slap us in the face mm -hmm. and say, hey, we, you know, and I'm not saying everybody's going to succeed. And like when I was trying to give up alcohol, it was kind of like, I can remember, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink. Then I'd hear the vodka bottle downstairs going, Bill, I love you. Come and visit me. Okay. So it, it's kind of like you need, you're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You need to dust yourself up and get back in the game. You need to remember what the goal is. And it's like this with sports. It's like this with mental health. It's like this with giving up addiction. And it's like this in sports. You have to make the decision that this is what I want more than anything else. Man, that's dope. Dr. Pitts, did you have any uh, any final questions or any uh, any final comments that you would like Phil to speak on before we begin to wrap up? I, um, my husband said, when is he coming back for a second show? And, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and where's your book so we can buy it? Um, <laughs> just wow. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, it takes a lot to make me speechless. It really, really does. I, I, I kid you not, by far, this is one of the most powerful, powerful mm -hmm. testimonials we have ever had on this show. And we've been doing this with our emphasis on sports and mental health for this is our third season, Phil. Uh, you, I, you, you embody what resilience is. You embody what it means to win and to grow and to, oh it, it I, I'm just I'm in all and I say that with the utmost I, I, sincerity I'm in all that that means a lot because I, I I tell people all the time one of the greatest one of the greatest gifts I've gotten even from competing at 60 mm -hmm. is the feedback I get from people yeah. okay and, and how how many people tell me I started taking up jujitsu at 40 because I saw you or mm -hmm. I started doing this because, you know, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like, and not that, not that's, in other words, that once again, that's a side benefit type of thing. It's not why mm -hmm. I do it, but it's awful. Mm -hmm. It's awfully nice to know that if I share my story, like if one, if one person mm -hmm. listens to this show and yeah. decides to get help and changes your life, yeah. the world is a better place because I went on this show and, and you know, life, life, you know, was, we can either go through life. And mm -hmm. we can like one of the things I, I got out of uh, having the cancer was the idea that all I I want to live every minute of life, truly live it. Too many people sit back and they're just putting in time till they die. I want to experience. I want to make memories. I, I want to have fun. I want to. I want to impact others because when, when you look at it, a generation from now. Yeah. Unless I've impacted others, I, I never really existed. When we really look at it, you know, everybody thinks we're so important, but in real, in the real life, we're kind of, you know, we can help others. That's our only real importance. 
Okay, um, because like you know, if if we do if we do great things and then take it to the grave, nobody's going to know we did great things unless we help others. Yeah. Right. That's real. Absolutely. And R Ronnie, and, be, real real quick before okay. you close us out, I just um because I do want you to close us out. Um, I just wanted to give a quick shout out um to Bryce Batts, the podcast host for Wine After Work. Um, I was able to be a guest on her podcast the other day had a phenomenal conversation focused on women in business and entrepreneurship and sports and mental health. So just wanted to show some love to her for having me on again. That podcast is Wine After Work and you can find her wherever podcasts are. So thank you to Bryce Betts for having me on. Go ahead and take us out, Alan. Phil, I, I think you would appreciate this quote that I'm gonna close the show out with, man. I think, I think you kind of embody this and you are a walking testimony of this. It says life's journey is not about is not to arrive at the grave safely in a well-preserved body, but rather skid in sideways, totally worn out, shouting, holy crap, what a ride. And I think everything you shared with us today is a testament of that and, and really maximizing what it means to be alive every day and experience life. Uh, man, thank that you. For sharing that testimony. Oh, go ahead. That means a lot because that's actually one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> Man, I, I think you really embody that, man. And, and once again, man, just thank you for sharing your testimony and, and coming on today. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, we definitely want you to be back on the show um, as we get ready to open season four in the fall, man. So uh, we will definitely be reaching out to you uh, in the summertime to get you back on in the fall, man, because um, people need to hear your voice, to hear your story. Um, as we wrap up, Phil, how can people reach out to you? How can people find you? Uh, what business endeavors do you have going on? Just let the people know what you're up to and what you got going on. My school is uh, www.lexingtonbjj.com, and you can uh, find me on social media under my name, Phil Dunlap, and there'll be a picture of me being interviewed by Chalson, and it's always my uh, my little icon. So it's you, you, it's it's pretty easy to get a hold of me, and the, anybody needs advice, anybody anybody wants to ask a question, I always try to help others. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, Phil, thank you once again for being on this morning. We really appreciated it. Thank you for everybody who listened to us. Make sure you go to uh, YouTube, to Dr. Lauren Piss, and uh, subscribe and like the channel. Go ahead, Dr. Piss, like you ready to say something? Um, Tomorrow's Mother's Day. Oh, yeah. My bad. My bad. My bad. Happy, uh, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Happy Mother's Day, Dr. Piss. My bad. My bad. I'm actually, uh, look, I mean... <sighs> I gotta go finish up some last minute see for me the month of May is really a lot because tomorrow's Mother's Day and then my wife's birthday is Tuesday so I'm over here like that's trying to do birthday up. huh that's my son's birthday you never told me that Miss Ransom's birthday was May 16th yeah all your sons are tour. He is. Happy birthday, Andre and Miss Ransom. Yay! Happy, happy birthday, Andre. Happy birthday, Miss Ransom. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. And happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Yes. Um, we'll be back here next week, same time, same place. I actually won't be here next Saturday. I'll be speaking at um, a uh, therapy expo here in Richmond, Virginia next Saturday from 12 to 3. So if you're in the Richmond area, um, come on by. Tickets are $10 to get in. Uh, looking forward to sharing some information, sharing some insight, and really trying to uh, bridge some gaps in some of these communities out here with the mental health and everything. So um, if yes. you're in Richmond, check it out. Uh, if not, hope everybody enjoys the rest of the weekend. Phil, thank you again. Happy Mother's Day. Thanks Dr. for Phil. having me. I had a great time. Thank yes, you. Sir, thank man. you. We appreciate you. Everybody have a great weekend. We'll see y'all then. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.